Shalom. Welcome to Lights of the Nations. We are now ready to begin the fourth chapter of Hilchot Beit HaBechira, Maimonides' Laws of the Chosen House. And by and large, we're going to find that in this chapter, the Rambam deals with the measurements and the structure of the Holy Temple. And we'll also see that the opinion of Maimonides regarding certain aspects of the measurements and structure of the Temple itself are actually quite unique. Before we begin this chapter, I just want to conclude, give some concluding remark about the last subject that we studied about, the subject of the kiur, the laver. You know that Maimonides ended the third chapter of Hilchot Beit HaBechira with the 18th entry, the halacha regarding the concept of the kohanim who must sanctify their hands and feet, kiddush yadayim v'raglayim, with the water of the laver before doing any of their duties in the Holy Temple. I saw a very beautiful idea expressed by one of our sages regarding the significance of the sanctifying with the water of the laver, which I think applies to each and every one of us. You know, the Kohanim who enter into the Temple, the descendants of Aaron, they are really responsible for the influx of divine blessing into the world. They have an awesome task to bring this blessing into the world through their duties in the temple. And how interesting that the first thing they must do before assuming these duties and before attending to their awesome responsibilities is to wash their hands and feet. One of our great sages explains this on a symbolic level. The idea being that it is so important for the Kohanim to be connected to the moments of living for Hashem and for being open to being able to bring this blessing into the world that they must literally wash themselves from their previous notions, from yesterday's conceptions, from their previous ideas so that they don't have any value judgments, so that they don't have any kind of leftover ideas even from the previous day so that this is really an idea of washing off everything that they thought of until now and beginning totally anew for God. This, of course, can be translated into an aspect of the service of God for all of us, even those of us who are not at the moment serving in the temple, how important it is for us to realize every day that this is a new day, that we are beginning all over again to serve God, to literally cleanse ourselves, wash ourselves of everything that we thought of up until now and to totally begin anew. Because, of course, the danger if we don't do that is for us to be building up images upon images upon ideas of stale things, of commonplace things, until we, un of everything that we thought of until now. But again, like the secret of the showbread, when we are really in the presence of God, everything is constantly fresh and renewed and doesn't get old. So now, beginning the fourth chapter of Hilchot Beit HaBechira, Maimonides begins by telling us about the Holy of Holies. And he gives us a very important tradition in Halacha Aleph, first entry of the fourth chapter. Evin Haita Bekodesh HaKadoshim B'maravo. There was a stone in the Holy of Holies on its western side, She'aleha haya ha'aron munach. And upon this stone, the Ark of the Covenant rested. Of course, Maimonides here is referring to the famed foundation stone, the Evin Hashtia. Again, making the parallel in the traditional texts between the words of Maimonides and those of the Mishnah, we find in Tractate Yoma the following statement is made. The, the, there was a stone there in the Holy of Holies from the days of the earliest prophets. This is the expression that's used in Tractate Yoma. Evin ha'itasha mi'emot nevi'im rishonim. There was a stone there from the days of the earliest prophets, and it was called Shtia, the Evin Shtia. And it was elevated above the surface of the ground, the height of three fingers. Now the word Shtia, Evin Shtia, the derivation of this word is that of foundation. And, in fact, the classic commentator, the Bartanura, on the Mishnah explains the derivation of this word 
Al shame shememena nishtat haolam, because from this stone the entire world was founded, the foundation stone, as it were, the center of creation. And in fact, the Bartanur continues, Shaba isad hakadosh baruch hu et olamo, because with this stone the Holy One, blessed be He, founded His world. And we have a rather poetic description in the Midrash Tanchuma that tells us that just as the navel is placed, is found in the center of a person, so too the land of Israel is in the center of the world, the holy temple at the center of Jerusalem, and the Ark of the Covenant in the center of the sanctuary and the foundation stone before the Ark of the Covenant from which the world was founded. Now Rashi explains that this expression, the Nevi'im Rishonim, the earlier prophets, the first prophets, is actually a reference to David and Samuel. And the commentary on the mission of the Teferit Yisrael explains that it was these, David and Samuel, who actually revealed the foundation stone, not that they actually had placed it there. However, there is a lot to say about the concept, this concept of the foundation stone. And first and foremost, we understand that this is, in fact, on a spiritual level and according to these Midrashim, even on a physical level, this stone is the very center of creation. And indeed, our sages tell us that even to this very day, the prayers of all humanity ascend to heaven through the foundation stone, the very center of creation. The impression that many people have when they hear about the foundation stone, when they study about it, is that it was there from the very, very beginning of time. And in fact, this seems to be the description. If God literally founded his world f based on this stone. However, the description that we read in Tractate Yoma seems to differ. There the description again is that there was a stone there from the days of the earlier, the original prophets was revealed by David and Samuel. So the question is what exactly is the nature of this stone? And of course there are two points on the Temple Mount that are fixed and that are of extreme importance. The place of the foundation stone, which of course according to the most central opinion and the one which we consider to be the most authoritative as we've discussed on many occasions, we are taught that the Dome of the Rock covers over the location of the foundation stone. And looking at a photograph of the Temple Mount as it stands today, we see a smaller cupola, a smaller building in front of the area occupied presently by the Dome of the Rock. And it is this area traditionally understood by us to be the location of the altar. And as we studied together when we spoke about the altar earlier, in the writings of Maimonides, Maimonides told us that the location of the altar is extremely precise. And the Rambam tells us it cannot be altered ever, altered. It cannot be moved. There is also a very specific relationship between the place of the altar and the place of the foundation stone. And all of this is really brought together in a very remarkable way by some of the Midrashim, um, they kind of explain the relationship between the place of the altar and the place of the foundation stone. There is a sort of spiritual conduit that connects between these two very, very important locations. There is one particular version of this in the Yalkut Shimoni. However, the one that I'd like to share with you, in fact, comes from the Pirkei de Rabbi Eliezer the chapters of the great Rabbi Eliezer, Rabbi Eliezer ben Horkonos. This is a very important work which dates back to the time of the Mishnah and very beautiful work. And here, this Midrash, the chapters of Rabbi Eliezer in chapter 35, tells us about the journey of the patriarch Yaakov. Jacob uh, traveled and set upon the place of the Temple Mount, as we read in Genesis chapter 28. We read that Jacob tarried there because the sun had set. And according to Jewish tradition, as is cited there by Rashi on that verse in Genesis 28, 
God caused the sun to set early so that Jacob would find himself in the place of the Temple Mount, and this would be the place where he would set himself down, settle down for the night, and in fact this was so that God could show him the vision of the ladder. And, of course, originally Jacob took twelve stones from the stones of the place. This is the expression in the verse. He took from the stones of the place and he placed them under his head. Later, we read that he took the stone. And it's quite famous, the Midrash, also cited by Rashi, that the twelve stones had united into one stone. Now, interestingly, what is not well known <coughs> is the tradition that is cited here by the Pirkei Rabbi Eliezer, that the twelve stones that Yaakov, our patriarch, our forefather Jacob, took and placed under his head. From where did he take these stones? What is the significance of these stones? He actually took them from the very altar upon which his own father Isaac had been bound by Abraham. And thus the verse tells us, Vayikach me'avne hamakom, from the stones of the specific place, the stones of the place, the well-known place, place alluded to, the very place of the altar. This in itself is a very beautiful tradition because actually the Akedah, the binding of Isaac, is a scenario which had paramount importance for the development of the Jewish people and for the service in the temple. <clears throat> the Midrash tells us that Abraham, when he bound Isaac and was told by the angel of God to stay his hand and not to offer him, this was the very founding, as it were, of the service in the temple. Because everything that Abraham needed to conjure up to summon forth all of his will and all of his strength, those are the feelings that are necessary when a person confronts God and confronts himself and has the experience of standing by the altar and bringing an offering. And Abraham had a vision of the Holy Temple at that moment, which teaches us that this was the moment of the actual, as it were, the laying of the cornerstone, the foundation of the temple. And he saw the continuum, the trajectory of the future of his children, his descendants coming and engaging in their relationship with the God of Israel, bringing offerings there at that very spot. So the binding of Isaac is so important. And here Jacob, who is the patriarch, the father of the twelve tribes of Israel, also became part of that continuum, as it were. In other words, the binding of Isaac did not affect him. It was his grandfather and his father. But by taking of those twelve stones for his own children from the very altar upon which his father had been bound, this is his participation, as it were, in that event and his statement that he too subjects himself to the will of God, <clears throat> includes himself in everything that is derived from and everything that is understood from that life-changing experience. Well, according to these Midrashic accounts, both that which is mentioned here in Pirkei Rebbe Eliezer and that which is cited in the al Shimoni, God himself took that stone that had been united, the twelve stones that had turned into one under Jacob's head, God took that stone and placed it into the very foundation of the earth. And that became, as it were, the foundation stone. And the analogy that I would use to, in order to understand this is kind of like, it reminds me of the Midrashic statement, the teaching, that God made creation conditional upon Israel's receiving of the Torah at Sinai. This is something that our sages tell us, that God actually made a condition with creation itself, that he would only establish it firmly and only really call it a done deal and say, okay, this is definitely going to work out once Israel received the Torah at Sinai. So until then, for 2,000 years, what was the, what was the um, situation? In other words, what was considered to be the the uh, status of creation until Israel received the Torah at Sinai, it was somehow a little bit shaky, somehow a little bit um, um, like jello, perhaps, a little bit quivering, not so firm. And then when Israel received the Torah at Sinai, God was able to say, oh, I see that it, creation is going to work out after all because people are going to be keeping the Torah and my statutes are going to be observed. And that firmed up the jello, kind of. 
so too, in other words, the, found, the place of the foundation stone is the very navel of creation. It's called, in fact, by our sages, the navel of creation. And when Jacob arose in the morning and consecrated that as the, as the place of the altar, God took that stone and kind of put it in as like a, as like a seal, like a bottle cap, like a lid. In Hebrew called a pakak, like, a, like the, the seal, put it into that space and shored up creation. This is actually what our sages are telling us, and this actually is a way of rectifying the idea of the stone which had been revealed there from the days of David and Samuel, and also that which we find in some of the mystic literature of our sages, that there is this relationship, this conduit, this spiritual connection between the place of the altar and the place of the foundation stone. And I think the proper way of understanding that is illustrated by this idea here in Perkei Rabbi Eliezer that the foundation stone was taken from the place of the altar, as is illustrated here, obviously in a, in a very homiletical understanding that God himself took that stone and placed it into the navel of the earth, into the place of the foundation. And in fact, that became the foundation stone. So Maimonides continues and tells us about the tradition of the foundation stone. Let's just recap again. Evan Hayata Bakodosh Kodoshim Bamaravo. There was a stone, on the western side of the Holy of Holies, upon which stood the Ark of the Covenant. And before it was placed Vilfanav, before it was placed Tsinsenet Haman, a jar, a container of manna, Umate Aharon, and the staff of Aaron. These two things specifically, there are actually verses in the Torah that God tells us a command for these things to be placed as a testimony. And this is where they were placed, in the Holy of Holies, next to the Ark of the Covenant, a jar of manna, and also the staff of Aaron that blossomed, where the almond blossomed, blossoms, if you recall, in the controversy with Korach, where God indicated his will his choice of Aaron by the fact that it was Aaron's staff that blossomed. And this was to be an eternal testimony to the preeminence of the tribe of the Kohanim, of the descendants, the lineal descendants of Aaron was to be placed there at all times in the Holy of Holies. Now, I just would like to point out that Maimonides here tells us in his words, and we are faithful here in our study to the words of the great Rambam, we also want to understand all of his derivations <coughs> and how he reaches his conclusions. Maimonides tells us that this stone inside the Holy of Holies, upon which the Aaron stood, was in the western part of the Holy of Holies. The truth is, we are not familiar with the source of where Maimonides concludes that the stone, in fact, stood on the, in the western side of the Holy of Holies. There are other opinions that are expressed amongst our sages that maintain that the Aaron actually stood in the very center of the Holy of Holies. Um, that seems to actually make a little bit uh, more sense because of the fact that we know that when the high priest came into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur, he stood between the staves, the poles of the Ark, which in indeed protruded up to the curtain. There's also an opinion that is expressed that the, that the Ark stood uh, in the eastern part of the Holy of Holies. In any event, this is something that we need to mention. There is also an idea that, of course, in the time of the Second Temple, when the High Priest entered into the Holy of Holies, he faced directly the stone itself, the foundation stone, because the Ark of the Covenant, as we're about to learn, stood in the Holy of Holies only in the First Temple. And so when as required by the service of the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, when the high priest entered into the Holy of Holies carrying the vessel with incense, which he was to place in front of the Ark of the Covenant, in the era, the epic of the Second Temple, he placed this small shovel with the incense, placed it down on the foundation stone itself. Now regarding the Torah's command for placing a jar of manna in the Holy of Holies, we find the verse actually in Exodus 
chapter 16, verse 33, where God tells us, take a container, one container of man, and place in there a measurement, the full measurement of an omer, of man, of manna, and place it there before Hashem. And regarding the staff of Aaron, we find after the controversy of Korach in the book of Numbers, it's chapter 17 and verse 25, we find the verse, return the staff of Aaron before the testimony as a remembrance, as a watching. And this is actually the, to the Torah source of these two items being placed as a testimony in the holy area. According to <coughs> another rabbinical source, there was also a container of anointing oil. The oil which Maimonides in another place gives us an exact recipe as to how this oil was made. The oil which we study about in the Torah which was used to, consec to consecrate the holy items and the Kohanim for the service in the Holy Temple, according to this rabbinic source it's actually the Tosefta. A, a, a container of this anointing oil also was placed in the Holy of Holies next to the Ark of the Covenant. However, as you notice, Maimonides himself, in this particular halacha, does not mention the anointing oil. He only mentions the jar of manna and the staff of Aaron. And perhaps that is actually because of the fact that um, the oil itself is not mentioned as a command by one of the verses, but it's, it's our sages that derive that in a particular method of analysis. They come to the conclusion that the anointing oil also was placed there. <clears throat> Imanus continu continues and tells us this famous tradition that we've had occasion to mention from time to time that at the time that Shlomo, King Solomon, with his great wisdom, oversaw the construction of the first temple, Be'et Shabana Shlomo et Abayet, V'yada Shasofu Lecharev. And of course, King Solomon, the wisest of all men, knew with his prophetic enlightenment that eventually the holy temple would be destroyed. Banabo makom lignozbo haaron lamata bematmoniot amukot vaakalkalot. He devised a place, he built a place for the Aaron, for the Ark of the Covenant to be hidden underneath the Temple Mount in the in the tunnels, in the deep and and um, complicated winding tunnels underneath the Temple Mount. This, these are the words of Maimonides. And Yoshiyahu, Josea, king of Israel, before the destruction of the first temple, commanded that these things be hidden in that place that Solomon had devised, especially for this purpose, so that they would not fall into the hands of the enemy. Yoshiyahu HaMelech Tziva Ugnazo B'makom Shabana Shlomo Shlomo. That King Josea commanded at a certain point in time, historically, for these things to be hidden in that place. And this is all derived from a verse. And the verse is actually found in the book of Chronicles. We'll read it together. It's in the second Chronicles, where we read, it's actually in chapter 35 of Chronicles 2, where we read, and he set the priests in their watches and encouraged them to the service of the house of Hashem. And he said to the Levites, who taught all of Israel, who were holy to the Lord, put the holy ark in the house which Shlomo, the son of David, king of Israel, did build. You need no longer carry it upon your shoulders. Serve now Hashem your God and his people Israel and prepare yourselves by the houses of your fathers according to your divisions, according to the writing of David, king of Israel, etc. From this verse, in which it is stated, you need no longer carry it upon your shoulders, the sages derive that Josea actually commanded the Levites to hide the ark in that very place. So here, Maimonides records for us the tradition that Yoshayahu HaMelech, Josea, the king of Israel, commanded that the ark of the covenant be hidden in this place. And of course, the ark of the covenant has been popularized, it's been it's been romanticized and, and described a great deal in popular culture, in movies and in books, and there are many theories that abound regarding the eventual hiding place of the Ark of the Covenant, but according to this particular tradition that Maimonides records, and again, there are actually other Jewish traditions as well that speak of alternatives of the possible exile of the Ark of the Covenant according to this particularly central tradition, that Maimonides records, there seems to be little doubt about the fact 
that the Ark of the Covenant, in fact, was hidden underneath the Temple Mount. In our own time, actually, some of uh, the great rabbis of the previous generation claim to have known exactly where the Ark is, based on the writings of Maimonides, as well as a secret tradition that had been handed down to them. And of course, this is something that had been reported about a great deal, efforts made by these men to uh, reach the place, the resting place of the Ark of the Covenant. In any event, we're going to uh, learn more and finish this particular halakha of Maimonides and learn a little bit more about this fascinating tradition, what else is hidden in that place, and why were these things not recovered and not brought back to the second temple? We believe that to this day the Ark of the Covenant and a number of other very important items are in fact hidden in this very chamber designed by King Solomon for this purpose underneath the Temple Mount. And we do believe that we know the whereabouts of this place. Even to this day there are those rabbis who are quite aware of the location of this chamber and are quite certain, according to our tradition, that when the time comes for us to rebuild the temple, the Ark of the Covenant indeed will be brought forth and placed in its proper place, the Ark of the Covenant representing, of course, the indwelling of the Divine Presence, the Shekhinah in the Holy Temple, the light to Israel and the light to the nations.